welcome everyone. Um, it's good morning for me. I'm in Minnesota, um, in Minnesota where it is so wonderfully snowing today. Uh, I know a lot of you are in North Carolina and I know that you know people are, are joining this conference from really all over the world. Um, and I'm one of those like crazy Minnesotans that that goes crazy uh, for the snow. I'm also like your your typical Minnesotan and that like obviously the first thing that I introed with was the weather. Um, so thank you all for joining today. Um, I'm talking about open source as a service to modernize healthcare um, and really thinking about the ways that we create that community um, what, around open source technologies within United Health Group and more specifically Optum. Um, Optum is the technology arm for United Health Group. Um, so people haven't always heard of Optum, but sometimes people have heard of uh, United Health Group. So I like to root it in that. Um, today, I'll be talking you know, through these examples of the ways that we create this community. And all of the teams that I mentioned today are also hiring, which is why this falls under the job track. Um, I'll reference more of those specifics at the end of the talk. Um, and then today for my example of creating community, I'll really be rooting in the example of Kafka. It's one of my favorite open source solutions um, and it's used heavily at Optin. So um, I will be going into depth on that. But first I will uh, give everyone a little bit about me. Uh, so Kate Agnew, I'm a director of software engineering at United Health Group. I've been here for three years. Uh, and my team of engineers stands up Kafka, Cassandra, and Elasticsearch as a service to the enterprise. Uh, I'm really passionate about diversity in tech efforts. Uh, so I'm a part of the United Women Leading in Technology Initiative, UWLIT. Um, and I'm the former managing director of the nonprofit Girls in Tech based out of uh, the Twin Cities here. It's a global organization, but I was a part of the Minneapolis chapter. Um, I have my bachelor's of arts in math uh, from McAllister College in St. Paul, Minnesota, and I obtained my MBA from MIT. Unrelated to like everything that I do in the tech world, um, I'm also a planning commissioner for my local city uh, government here. Uh, and then I'm also on two boards. Uh, I serve on the McAllister College Alumni Board as well as the board of an all girl STEM charter school in St. Paul called Laura Jeffrey Academy. Um, I also uh, used to have a podcast, it's called Drinks With Her. Um, and then I kind of stopped it when I got pregnant and I wasn't drinking. Um, and then COVID happened and I was like, I don't know if I wanna do it remotely, um, but it's definitely something that I'm gonna be spinning back up. So if, if listening to women drink and chat about really fun, uh, fun stories is, is appealing to you, make sure you check that out. Um, at work, I try my artist to keep up with um, Band Shirt Thursday, which I introduced to the team. I'm a huge fan of the band Hanson, like yes, Mbop Hanson. Um, and so every Thursday, the team rotates through and we wear different band shirts. Um, and I also collect uh, Simpsons action figures. So I don't have any in view right now, but trust me, they're out there. Um, so why Optum? Um, I, I've been here for three years now um, and just really passionate about using data and using technology to really impact people's lives. And I, I felt that healthcare could be the place to do that. Um, so when I joined the team, um, the footprint of Kafka was like zilch. Um, there were maybe a couple of teams that were standing up Kafka on their own, um, but nothing that was standardized. Um, and at the time, we really needed a repeatable, scalable way to standardize and expose data to customers. Um, and I'm going to walk through this model, not because it, it matters for the talk today, but really just to set the foundation of why we chose some of the open source technologies that we did. Um, so this model here really walks through, you know, we have a mainframe, we use change data capture, uh, then we have raw data streams going through Kafka, we do a standard standardization layer within Cassandra, we have the standardized Kafka stream, and then we build materialized views in Cassandra or Elasticsearch to create enterprise APIs that then consumers use to tackle that data. Um, so everything that you see here is open source except for CDC. Um, for those of you not familiar with Change Data Capture, um, it really just like taps into the transaction log and that's what uh, it ports into Kafka. Um, and I think that we've used different products for CDC, um, but that's the only one that isn't open source. Um, 
knowing that we wouldn't be able to do this pattern for all data across the enterprise in a silo, we really chose open source technologies because we wanted to change the culture and empower teams to fully understand the technology they were implementing. Um, so open source obviously enables teams to really lift up the covers while using the public internet um, to solution and troubleshoot for anything that they run into. Um, why Kafka specifically? Uh, honestly, like everyone else was doing it. Um, there were some large retailers who had enabled their multiple fulfillment options by modernizing supply chain management through the use of Kafka. Um, and then of course, like LinkedIn created Kafka to facilitate activity tracking and to solve the question of the, the problem, I guess, of how all data and applications in a big digital company become plugged together. Um, so today at Kafka, um, we have a pretty large footprint. I won't go into like the, all of the nitty gritty details on this, um, but we're managing, you know, over 500 nodes across two data centers, um, almost 600 customers. And so what started out really, really small has become a huge offering um, to the enterprise. And, and I'll kind of take you through some of the specifics of that journey. I think this is the interesting part because it shows, um, and I, I won't belabor this too much, but I think it really shows, you know, where we came from within the organization of Kafka, you know, just being run by a couple of one-off teams to where it is today. And it's really exciting because we're doing this, you know, not just for Kafka, but we're doing this across a ton of different open source technologies. And it's a really exciting time to be at, at our organization. And I had a lot of fun with this slide because of the animation. So I'll go, I'll go quickly through it. But um, so in 2017, we really started on just a couple of VMs. Um, we needed it for our own use case of building out that eligibility. Data eligibility is just a, a healthcare um, term that really checks, you know, is a member eligible for certain services? And so we were building out these eligibility APIs. So we had an, a single eligibility um, source of truth that we were then um, creating a couple topics off of to then bring through that chain to create the materialized views. Um, but soon uh, we realized that building it on VMs just wasn't the most scalable for what we needed. Um, part of it has to do with, you know, kind of the oh, our own internal um, bureaucracies of spinning up VMs and the management of the VMs. So pretty soon um, I acquired 400, 400, no, uh, 40 servers for our use case, which was really oversized at the time for what we needed. Uh, but at the same time, it's hard to purchase uh, servers within a Fortune 6, Fortune 7 organization. And so I wanted enough that would meet our needs for at least the short term. And at that time, we were really dog fooding. So creating it for our own needs, um, honestly, because proximity to the to the customer is key and, and really in those early stages. Uh, and you can't really get closer than yourself. Um, at that same time, then people got wind that we had acquired these servers. And so they're like, oh, hey, can I just like maybe get a topic or two on your Kafka? Um, and we, we naively said, sure, we have this space, we can do that. Um, and then like before we knew it, um, we created what was then called Kafka as a service prod, CAS prod. Uh, because all of these customers that all of a sudden, you know, just wanted a couple of topics at a time were saying, oh, hey, we're going to production now. Um, so we started really ramping up that offering. One, continuing to make sure that Kafka as a service was what we needed for our own use case, um, but then bringing on more and more users. So we had hundreds of topics um, and a couple of other clusters that we stood up. So people brought their own VMs and we ran the Kafka for them on their own VMs. Um, at that time, it was really um, me kind of serving, serving as product owner or finance and strategy and roadmap and kind of all of the non-engineering type stuff. And then I had Luke. Luke was my, my main partner in this, uh, my only partner in this. And at the time, he did literally everything. So in all of our GitHub documentation, you know, he was running a, a system in prod for, like I said, a Fortune 7 organization. And he just listed his cell phone number. Um, he had a flip phone at the, well, no, he still has a flip phone because um, he's that kind of techie, uh, which is fantastic. But yeah, he literally just had his flip phone phone number in our GitHub documentation. Um, so as we continued to scale and to grow, um, we started leveraging pager duty. Um, this really made it a little bit simpler um, to 
offer that 24 seven support uh, and then made it so that we could tap in a couple of our um, people going through the technology development rotational program. Um, it's something that we have at Optum, we call them TDPs, um, but they're really um, straight out of grad school or straight out of undergrad and they go through two six month rotations. And so we had a few of those folks on our team and we wanted to get them into the, the spin of um, supporting a production environment. Uh, and so they joined our on-call support. Um, we also then brought in a team in India. We created a rate card so that we could begin charging people for our usage. And all of a sudden we had this non-production environment that had already achieved 1000 pull requests. Um, we then also in 2019 started spinning up footprints at Azure. Um, we had specific workloads that needed to be run there. So we said, sure, let, let's try and do that. Um, so running at Azure was purely on VM still at that point as well. Um, early this year, which I mean, it seems like it was a really quick journey, but we achieved 1000 um, PRs within our prod environment. Uh, and then we also started spinning up clusters as a service. Um, so the clusters as a service allows us to uh, meet the needs of, of customers who have bigger footprints. Um, but ultimately what we do for Cassandra and Elasticsearch is we have, we now have over 400 bare metal servers, which is why I slipped earlier. Uh, but we deploy Kubernetes on those servers and then we deploy Cassandra or Elasticsearch. And then now as of 2020, April and 2020, uh, we started doing that with Kafka as well. Um, so that really gives people a dedicated environment as opposed to the multi-tenant environment that is CAS prod and CAS alpha. Um, and so all of a sudden we had four different flavors of Kafka as a service running within the enterprise. And then that's when we began thinking more about Kafka as a product. It was less about us always responding to the newest flavor or the newest thing that customers needed. And we were able to take a step back and understand like, how is this perceived within the environment? What's the voice of our customers? What's the user experience? Um, those things became a lot more important, obviously the bigger and bigger that we grew. Um, then thankfully the team expanded. Um, at, at that point in time, you know, we were still running basically with Luke. And then I think it was really two other engineers that were supporting this environment. And given how big it was, um, we were experiencing some burnout. And so I made it my top priority to hire, hire, hire. Um, so bring in as many people as we could. And I think, you know, still figuring out like what's the right scale of bringing in a bunch of new people, but also making sure that you can continue meeting on the deliverables. Um, so right now I think it's a team of nine um, that's supporting Kafka as a service specifically. And we still do have a couple of open positions um, for that team in particular. Um, so right now, Footprint's huge. Uh, we're about to achieve 10,000 PRs in CAS Alpha. Uh, and then we're also exploring, you know, where else should we make Kafka as a service generally available? Um, like I said before, um, Kafka as a service at Azure is still relatively bespoke and it's, it's not as automated as we need it to be. Uh, so we're building out the tooling needed to scale better at Azure or, or GCP or wherever else um, we decide that that footprint needs to happen. So um, what role does community play and, and where have we really been leaning into recently? Um, like I said, this was literally done with a handful of engineers. Um, and really, we were a small team and we continue to be still a relatively small team compared to what some of these other teams are. Um, you know, you see across other organizations or in other places, they might have 30 plus engineers running their Kafka as a service. Um, and so in order for us to really scale the offering that we have, we need to use technology for that. People don't scale, technology does. Um, and this is really where I think that community comes into play. Um, so do, do, do I have more auto animation. Okay, um, open source really allows us to speak that common language, uh, relatively common language. So many of our first users back in 2017 weren't familiar with GitHub, which made our GitOps method for topic management a bit of a learning curve. Um, this common language really means that we can point people to the public internet for tutorials on GitHub, or when people are first starting out with Kafka, we can point them to Overstack, uh, uh, whatever, um, all of these different places that really are focused on 
what have other people done? Um, what, what else is out there in the environment? Um, thankfully, <laughs> the need to have people go through uh, tutorials on GitHub has really waned out. Um, most people are familiar with a lot of those basic tools now, um, but leaning into that common language is still an important part of what we do. Um, telemetry. Telemetry is really key on both sides of the coin. So we need our clients to have the ability to answer what's wrong. Is it on the customer side or is it on the host side? Clients can use the community to stand up their own monitoring and dashboards to answer this question. Um, but to go even deeper, we look for our users to troubleshoot themselves first, try a couple of things, research the issue. Um, we always encourage teams to do this by asking them, what have you tried so far? Um, and prompting for this in our support intake process as well, you know, please outline what you've tried and what the results were. Um, so ultimately, you know, we do what we can do and help to help ensure that our users are successful, but using Kafka uh, for an application requires that the teams leveraging it know enough about Kafka to troubleshoot and telemetry helps them dig into that. Automation. Um, so we automate wherever we can. Infrastructure as code and CI/CD are really the only ways we can manage at our scale with the engineers that we have. And from the start, the engineers developing Kafka have been in the flows, as we call them. So we use Flowdoc pretty heavily within Optum. Um, so they've been interacting with the community directly. Um, initially, the Kafka flow was started um, in an effort to create that community but without that clear definition of what the intention was for that, it turned into a room where we began offering support. Um, and I think that that's kind of overburdened that Kafka flow to date. Um, but regardless, our engineers have been interacting with the users from the start, which has really allowed us to improve and address issues that our users feel are the most important. Next is documentation. I think documentation is literally one of the most important things um, for any open source software. Um, there's endless documentation on these platforms on the public internet. Uh, and we link heavily to those uh, offerings and those um, information hubs in our own internal documentations. Um, but we also internally outline the specifics to our offerings, walk people through getting started, uh, describe the nuances for operating within our network, uh, whether or not we are in the DMZ or within the core, those types of things. Uh, and we really rely on our users to read the documents first. Um, again, we can't always be there to point people um, to the right section of the markdown. And so it's really imperative that we rely on our documentation to scale and not the people. Um, one place that I'd see us, I'd like to see us get even better as an organization is through contributing to the docs. Um, so I think that 99.9% .9 of the Kafka documentation has been written by the Kafka engineers. I would like to see more of a, a community um, environment where people feel if they see something that might be wrong or might not be as clear going in and doing their own PR, um, which has happened a couple of times, but I, I hope continues to become more and more popular as more of these open source um, technologies are out there. And then don't just rely on official Kafka docs. You know, I always tell people there are 600 teams using Kafka across the enterprise and internally everything should be public. So browse the UHG GitHub for other code examples, see what other people are doing out there. Um, and, and really what we try and how we hone in on this um, in our flows is, you know, where else have you looked for an answer to this before asking in Flowdoc? Um, we don't really say it to call people out, um, but really as an encouragement to get people looking other places. Um, Google it. Google it first, please. Um, Kafka is so widely used and there are examples of almost everything on the public internet that you can do with, with Kafka. Um, so for example, if you get an error, Google it first rather than posting it directly into the Kafka flow. Uh, not only will our users get a quicker answer, um, but then they'll learn from others outside of the organization or from others even within our internal organization without having to go directly to the Kafka engineers uh, for that type of an answer. Um, this is how we built the platform ourselves, right? We Googled everything um, and it, it continues to be how we troubleshoot. So it works for more than just Kafka. 
Um, clearly defining roles and responsibilities is also super important. And that's always clearly defined within our terms of service. Uh, but we run the platform and our client teams manage their configurations and implementations. So some teams want more assistance than we have the scale to offer. And in these situations, we can connect them with third party consulting firms who may be able to provide better services or, or more timely services. Um, but ultimately, this is another spot where we really rely on the community to come into play, um, share best practices, um, join together and not make the Kafka team the single source of truth. Um, so giving the space for our community to lean in here, I think is really what will be needed to help take Kafka to the next level. And like I said, this kind of goes back to the, the chat, right? Um, we had initially started it to bring that community together, but have found over the years, it's, it's mainly just pull requests. So how can we back that up and make a community within the enterprise, I think is gonna be really important um, and becomes you know, really one of the backbones to offering out open source software um, it's also one of the hardest pieces to create. Um, so Kafka user groups, I think would be really powerful in another, um, I don't know, maybe COVID has actually made this easier, right? But one of the things about United Health Group is that we're extremely distributed. And so, you know, we have offices in New Jersey and Connecticut and North Carolina and California and Colorado and Minnesota. And even in Minnesota, there are literally, I think like 15 different headquarter buildings throughout the state. And so it really makes it difficult to form groups that come together for brown bag lunches or happy hours. But I think that COVID has made me just think outside of the box a little bit more and realize that we still can really lean into this community and create that space for community to come together um, if we put that focus to it. Um, and so another thing, you know, is really answering questions. Our Kafka flow has over 1500 users now, most of whom are using Kafka on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and so, you know, people that are in the Kafka flow, encouraging those who aren't on the Kafka team to also come and answer questions, I think is gonna be really, really important. Um, and then I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention GitHub as well. Um, we're still working towards making sure every team has their GitHub internally public um, but I, I think that, you know, all of these things together will, will really help create that community that we need um, to ensure that uh, open source is successful. Um, so we're really just beginning and great. I left enough time for questions. I sometimes feel like I'm going to go and talk about Kafka for an endless amount of time. Um, but like I said, we're only just beginning. Um, and if you want to join us and be a part of this modernization evolution, we are hiring a ton. Um, and so on this next slide, um, I've listed out our careers website, um, careers at careers.unitedhealthgroup.com. Um, my email address is also on there. And then I've listed the job codes for a couple of the positions within our, our team. Um, my team, the Healthcare Cloud Data Platforms team, falls under the broader healthcare cloud organization. And so, you know, I went deep into Kafka today, um, but there's even within just my team, there's Kafka, Cassandra, and Elastic. And then across the broader healthcare cloud umbrella, there's a ton of other technologies that people are rolling out. Um, there's the OSFI team, and I forget what all of the letters stand for, but they basically manage the, the OpenShift, the Kubernetes as a service. Um, their Kubernetes is a little bit different from our flavor of Kubernetes, given that we're building the data platforms on top of that. Um, but there's, you know, there's a lot out there and you know, cloud is in our name. Um, my team is one of them that's a little bit nuanced because we have quite a footprint on premises as well as in the cloud. Um, but it's really about the internal public cloud, internal private cloud, as well as the public cloud and how, how we're bridging um, some of those barriers. And, and I don't like to use the word hybrid, but thinking about, you know, workload placement and when should something be on premises versus um, in the cloud. And those are really important things that we're thinking about. Um, so I want to, I want to leave this up, but I also want to get to questions. Let me see if I can figure out how to make this work. All right. So I will just like blanket, open it up for questions. Um, I think that there are the three paths for doing this. Um, chat might be the easiest. You can also use like the actual Q and A. Um, or third option is you could raise your hand. And then I think that I 
I or ATO will unmute you so you can verbally ask your question. Any, I mean, the questions can range, right? Um, about Optum, about our use of open source, about Kafka, about how we manage um, 600 users of Kafka as a service for the enterprise, um, really anything that you're interested in. How we're working to get more uh, women in tech is always a fun question too. Um, okay, so I got one question. As a platform team who just started to offer managed Kafka, Cassandra, um, Solar and Elastic search on Kubernetes to other teams in our company, what are some things we should avoid? Any blind spots or major problems you face? Um, so I think, you know, one of the first things that we made a conscious decision of early on is that we would only be offering out these platforms to teams that were doing that, that flow that I showed early on, right? of taking raw data, standardizing it, and then making it available in materialized views for the enterprise. And I say this because it, I think that that's really important to have a specific use case defined and not thinking that your specific flavor or your type of elastic search is gonna meet everyone's needs. And so right now, you know, the flavor of Elasticsearch that we offer doesn't even have our back enabled, um, which is probably a miss, but because we were working on it for just very specific use cases, we didn't have that many customers that were looking to, um, you know, have a ton of people working within their Elastic. And so it worked. Um, now we're getting to the point in our maturity curve where we're thinking about offering out Elasticsearch more broadly. And we really still focus in on what's your use case. Are you building those materialized views? Are you pointing APIs at what you're building? Um, because there are other solutions out in the enterprise that are going to meet the needs for different things, right? So logging, Elasticsearch is often used for logging. Um, but there's a team at Optum that manages Splunk as a service. And so there, that's not something that we want to get in the business of supporting that logging specific use case. And so my advice is just be very kind of intentional about what are the use cases, who are the customers that you're gonna support and really go through a vetting process to make sure that those, those customers um, are fitting within that um, use case, I think specifically. Uh, one thing that we're also struggling with right now in deploying on Kubernetes is the ability to scale. Um, so we've, we've given customers the ability to um, define the size of their initial cluster. Um, and those initial clusters meet their needs for a couple of months. And then they say, hey, I'm gonna need more capacity. And so scaling in place is I think one of the, the harder things to do with Kubernetes. Um, we're getting pretty close to it. And I think it's something that we'll have early next year, um, but customers are always gonna need more. Use cases are always gonna grow. Footprints are always gonna grow. So think about the ways that you'll do that going forward. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be the one to enable that scaling. But in, in the case of, you know, Cassandra Elasticsearch, make it relatively easy for a user to migrate to a larger cluster. Um, you know, for maybe even with, with Kafka, right? Um, stand up Mirror Maker as a service so that they can replicate their data pretty easily and then get off that smaller footprint and, and move over to the larger one um, when they inevitably need to scale up. Um, so we got another question. Um, I'm a graduate student. Are there any full-time opportunities for new graduates? Um, so for both undergrad and grad students, I usually recommend the technology development program, TDP. And that program I think is, is really great. One, because I started in a rotational development program myself, and I really like the ability to rotate through different teams because I mean, I, I guess I'm a director of software engineering, but I literally still don't know what I want to be when I grow up. And so the ability to start a new career or start, you know, at a new company and be able to rotate, I think, through different teams really sets someone up for success, not only, you know, in navigating the ambiguity and figuring out how to like jump, jump into a team and ramp up quickly, but seeing how different teams work and function, you know, my team, it, I, 
I absolutely love my team, but my team is very different than, you know, a lot of the other teams across the enterprise. And you're not going to know that what the team is like that you're joining right away until you get a chance to explore a couple. So it's the technology development program and you can um, just search for that on the careers.unitedhealthgroup.com website. Um, any other questions that I can't answer? Otherwise I'll talk about the fact that I'm wearing a cape today. These things are awesome. All right, I will give, give everyone one more minute to ask a question. Otherwise I will wrap it early and you can have a lunch break. Um, so piggybacking on the last question, I was a data processor analyst at a university. Is Optum fr a friendly environment for career changes and starts? Um, so I mean, yes, I think so. I, in 2017, literally ran through four different job shifts. Um, I just finished grad school and didn't, again, really know what I wanted to do. And so I was I did uh, digital marketing data analytics for a little bit. And then I joined a startup where I was employee number seven at a artificial intelligence communication software firm. And then I got, I mean, it was a small startup. I got laid off after a little bit from that. Um, and then was a campaign manager for someone running for re-election for Minneapolis city council. Um, so this is all to say that like, you can have like any kind of journey. And then like the next job that I got, I started working at Optum. Um, this is now officially the longest that I've ever been at a company. And so I think that, you know, as long as you're able to tell that story and tell how um, what you've done helps build to what you will be doing at Optum, um, there's no reason you, you have to have had direct experience um, in, you know, even like the specific technologies or in the, the boots on the ground work that you'll be doing if you can show that journey and, and how you learn and adapt to new environments. Am I eligible to apply for TDP for June 21, 2021 start if I graduate in August 2021? Uh, technically, no, um, but there are four different start dates throughout the year. So you still just apply to that same one. You just wouldn't start in June. You would be placed probably in the October class because I think it's April, June, October, and December might be the four classes that they do every year. And so you would just be joining into the next one then um, from whenever you graduate. So you just wouldn't start in June. Uh, what is the most important value when hiring candidates? Um, it, it, this varies uh, greatly, obviously, depending on who, who the hiring manager is. Um, I've hired quite a few people already this year. Um, I look for the ability to like troubleshoot and learn on your own, right? I usually will ask people to walk me through um, a recent technology or software that they've, they've self-learned or recently learned and walk me through how they began that learning process. Um, so yay, spoiler, if you apply for one of my teams, I'll probably ask that question. Um, but what I'm looking for is an understanding of how does someone tackle something that's ambiguous? How do they get started in learning to new technologies? What are they Googling? What do they do when they get an error message? What are their trusted sources? Um, just really trying to tap into how they learn because I'm fully anticipating that, you know, the next person that joined my team isn't going to have three years of Kafka, two years of Cassandra, you know, experience with Kubernetes, right? Like we use a lot of technologies that, and some of which are gonna probably be new for people. And so I'm just more curious about how do they learn? How do they ingrain themselves within the team? Uh, is there a degree requirement for the TDP program? Uh, I think that there used to be, I think that they at one point required computer science, um, but related to that, I see the other question of um, no college degree and just having completed a coding boot camp um, this year. 
things have changed for TDP and they're actually opening it up. Um, so as a part of that, they now are accepting applicants who have gone through coding camp. So yes, to the question about having done a boot camp, um, but I don't, and I, so I would assume that they have also opened up which um, degrees courses they accept applicants from, but I do not know 100% that answer. If you email me though, I can um, research it and follow back up with you. All right, well, like I said, my emails are still on the screen. Um, there's our website and then just a, like a sampling of a couple of the job codes. Um, you know, for example, one of those um, software engineering jobs would be joining the, the MQ team. So helping to modernize our messaging platform into a self-service offering. So taking kind of an, an established product within the organization, MQ that exists today and, and really kind of mimicking in some ways, you know, like the self-service model that we have with Kafka where anyone can come and, and spin up their own topic. Um, so how are we doing that across the other technologies that may have more legacy roots within the enterprise? Um, and then for our product roles in particular, you know, we're, we're looking for, I only have two listed here, but I think that there are at least three open positions for innovative product managers to join the healthcare cloud team across the board. Um, I have one opening for a Kafka product owner specifically, um, but there are a couple of own others across the other products, but really looking for people who can help advance our products and services to making sure that, you know, critical healthcare applications and data are available in a secure and reliable fashion. So thinking more about the roadmaps, the funding, the strategy, kind of everything that, that boils into creating these products across the enterprise is something that we look for our product owners to lean into. Um, so with that, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for the great questions and follow up with me if you have any questions or if you're interested in any of these roles and you just want to chat some more. Thank you.